Welcome, everyone. My name is Caroline Colas, and I am the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. And it is my absolute pleasure to host the Positive Psychology Hour. This is a, a series that we have been doing for over three years now with the Whole Being Institute. The Positive Psychology Hour brings to you people and experts that are going to be talking about resilience. And today, especially, we have a, a special guest who's a favorite a, of ours, a speaker, um, Gary Redfeather, and we're going to explore nature's gift, an exploration of the beauty after trauma in trees. Today, we're going to uncover stunning examples of beauty after trauma or life after cancer from one of the most abundant sources on the planet, trees. We'll explore how trauma does not have to lead to states of disorder, chronic pain and suffering, or worthlessness. Using examples from nature, Gary Redfeather, who's a PhD and a, a pharmacologist, yeah, and, and myself, I'm a neosomatic black belt trainer, will highlight the utterly unique, beautiful, and immensely valuable new states brought about and because of, not despite, trauma. A little bit about Gary. He's an executive positive psychology coach, a leader development facilitator with more than 30 years experience. And his teaching research and professional practices, Gary weaves together a deep understanding of neuroplasticity which is the rewiring of the brain and the nervous system in the development of chronic pain, specifically in post-traumatic states. So he also uses holistic wellness therapies, including medical mindfulness and nutrition and organizational development with a focus on helping individuals and organizations increase their chances of achieving post-traumatic growth order, which is called PTGO versus PTSD which is both post-traumatic stress disorder. Gary's expertise has made him a sought-after coach and facilitator worldwide. We are delighted to have him here. And Gary, I understand that you are calling in from Wyoming, where you're visiting your folks? Yes. Let me put you on. Yes. yes. So what's the weather like out there? Um, wait, we just lost your picture, I think. Oh, well, it took a while. Hang on one second. Did we lose you? So can, yeah, I'm I'm here. <laughs> I think. I'm, Do you need to call back in? I don't know anyone else can hear. Hmm. Hi, okay. can you ask me? I see Carol. Carol Raff, can you see me? No, she can't. Said she can't. Yeah. Okay. Let me. If I can change my uh, video. Okay. Or just simply restart. Are you Did on your help? computer? Or yes, there we go. Fantastic. Okay. But we're having a hard time hearing you. Right. You're cutting back, in and out. Back and back. Thank you, everybody, as we adjust to these technical difficulties. Could you put in the chat, everyone, your um, your relationship to trees? If you like them, are you a tree hugger? Do you find, uh, have you read the book, the recent book about trees that uh, my mother requested? A tree hugger here, says Vanessa. Um, do you, some people have said, I feel more like a tree than a mountain or the ocean. There's even a, a little test you can say. Love trees, says Bet. All right. Tree hugger, says Jane C. Awesome. I love trees and birds that sit in them. Yeah. Beautiful point. Odd. Um, does it, did anyone ever read The Giving Tree? It's a children's book. We bend like a palm tree in a windstorm. Yes. Yeah. So trees have been used metaphorically for ever for a long time and um gary let me see if you can we can hear you yet just saw some amazing trees on sunday sat in the new york botanical garden donna oh i'm so envious a friend of mine just returned from japan where she was uh there for the cherry blossoms and she said it was just magical love trees just had the trees in my yard trimmed after a hard winter especially love flowering trees yes gary i am here okay let's hear you okay. can you hear me now yes can you hear we me? can yes go okay. for it 
Okay. Can you actually see me though? That's yes, the other thing. We can. Oh. All right. Well, thank you, Caroline, so much for being. I'm very thrilled to be here. Uh, it is a uh, wintry Wyoming still. We still have snow. We have more snow on the way, which is typical in Wyoming. Uh, uh, but I'm super happy to be here with you. This is the first time I've been back in the States for the past three years. So uh, this is kind of a, a, a warm welcome, a, a homecoming, if you will, both here in Wyoming and uh, and. Uh, and kind of just generally with you all. So what I'm going to do is uh, is interact with you, mostly with Carol, Caroline, uh, as we go forward. And I want to uh, show some of you uh, my my kind of my hobby, my passion uh, outside of neuroscience. And so I've been studying the human brain for about 30 plus years uh, and looking at how we really do develop into various states. Uh, there's an alternative of post-traumatic stress, which Caroline mentioned earlier, and uh, Kelly McGonigal and others have spoken about in the past, uh, and it's called post-traumatic growth, or post-traumatic growth order, PTGO. And I want to show you some artistic ways of looking at uh, trauma and growth. And to do that, I'm going to show you some of the artwork that I have created, and then Carol will show you uh, a little gift that she has later on. So let me share my screen. Uh, and Caroline, if you could verify that you can see the screen here. We can. Beautiful. So this is going to be just an exploration. It's going to be a journey, if you will. Now, I do want to recognize that some of the things that I may say may be a little bit triggering. If you have lived life, you have probably experienced trauma. And as we start to talk about trauma and seeing trauma, it may trigger uh, some some emotions within you. And so please, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling a little bit anxious as we're going through this, just please put me on mute. Take a couple deep breaths. Just simply look at the beautiful pictures and then tap back, tap back into us uh, by, by audio. Uh, we are designed to have emotions. And especially when we are talking about trauma, emotions do get triggered. And so please, please take care of yourself and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you during the next 45 minutes or so, because I want you to be tended to, not just me uh, showing you some things. So please, 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 please interrupt us and or please tend to yourself as we go through. So as Caroline said, we're going to look at trees. So this is a picture that I took just south of my house, kind of in, in winter, and it's called Aspen Alley. And it's a beautiful section of Wyoming that if you could see the road, there's a, a dirt country road that cuts right through this beautiful aspen grove. And in the autumn, when the leaves are changing color, it is absolutely like you're walking into a beautiful lit up area uh, of the world. And so it's a beautiful example of just how nature can show us so many beautiful things. One of those things is something that we'll talk about, and that is uh, is beauty after trauma, or more importantly, life after cancer, because we're going to be talking a lot about cancer as we go forward. Now, if I can advance my slides and you can tell me that they do advance, there we go. Yes. Can you see that next slide? I just want to take, okay. Gorgeous. So you all, you all are absolutely beautiful, majestic entities, just like this tree, just like this life, this picture, right? So this is not my picture. This is a picture that I got from this guy named Chris Lennett uh, on uh, uh, Unsplash. Just a beautiful picture really showing us that we all are these entities that are rooted, that are grounded, that are connected to the earth, that grow, that thrive, that mature, that have branches, that basically extend in so many di different directions. You are basically this tree, okay? Now, here's the reality of life. It is not a question of if trauma is going to happen in our life, it's when. And if the trauma doesn't happen to us, it happens to somebody very close to us, and that definitely will impact us. That is life. Some of these transformations, some of these experiences that we have are quite literal are quite literally catastrophic. Like the forest fires that raged in California and other areas of the world, we know that this is a natural phenomenon. It doesn't necessarily make life any easier, but it's just something that does happen. So some of life's transformations are utterly catastrophic. Some of them, however, are extremely subtle. So if you can imagine our life is a landscape, our life is ever-changing. 
most often times it changes on such subtle scales, but dramatic over time. Like this particular tree is clinging on to life in, in, in Utah. The ground around it is literally eroding with every rainstorm, with every snowstorm, with every passage of days and weeks and years, a little bit more gets eroded away. Now, the reality is this tree will eventually lose its footing. It will lose its hold on life and it will plunge into the chasm. Okay. Some of the transformations that we do see in life are these subtle things. And just because something is subtle doesn't mean it's not significant, right? This is something called allostatic load that a lot of people may have heard of by the, cam or the straw that breaks the camel's back. Well, an allostatic load are these subtle, tiny little pressures and stressors in our life that happen on a daily basis. On a daily basis, they don't seem to be anything that we can't handle. We brush them off like, oh, it was nothing. I was a little bit late. They, I got yelled at a little bit, you know, these types of things. These do have impact, especially over time. So we do need to look at both the catastrophic and the very subtle transformations that happen in our life because both of those can actually yield beauty. These are things that can actually help define our lives, kind of like the Phoenix Rising, that we are thrust into a, a situation where quite honestly, the things that we used to think were important get burned away. And when we emerge, we're actually lighter and more free and we figure out that we don't have to worry about, do I have food stuck in, the, in my teeth? Is my hair quite right? Do my, don't, do my clothes match? You know, these things that at one point in time in our lives, we may have thought of as critically important. We start to see that, yeah, they're not quite that important, okay? So these are the types of things that we're going to explore today. And we're gonna explore them through art, but art that actually comes from trees. And we need to recognize right off the bat that just like trees, we are all products of both nature and nurture, which means for us, for human beings, you are your mother and your father's genetics. Whether you like it or not, you are their genetics. We're our family history. And so we all start life with a rather unique blueprint. You know, our genes, even if we're identical twins to somebody, are not quite identical. We know there's variability. And so all of us are starting from this unique background, but yet we're all human. And so we are all connected and interconnected and alike in many, many ways. And yet we're all very fundamentally different just by genetics. And then as we start to consider how we are raised, how we're exposed to the environment, uh, the different types of food that we eat, the different types of places that we live, we all start to see that we are always this intertwined, absolutely undivorceable mixture of nature and nurture. Okay, now very importantly, nature can predispose some of us to cancer. Nurture can definitely make things better or worse, okay? Now, what we're going to talk about here is that there is definitely an interplay between nature and nurture when it comes to trees, as well as humans when it comes to the um, unfortunate likelihood of us developing a cancer or, or some kind of PTSD after we experience trauma, okay? Now, unfortunately, we really are all basically exposed to something not quite right, not quite nurturing in our environment, okay? And we react. We cannot not react. That is part of life. We react to it all the time. Okay. How we react is something that can be celebrated because we can potentially act and have something come out that is stronger than it was before, that is more beautiful than it was before. And I hope to show you examples of exactly that. And hopefully you'll see that you are exactly that in some way. So let's go back to this image of you and this tree, okay? Now, I like this image because it's strikingly beautiful and it's also a very good example of a non-natural, non-supportive environment. If you look around, how many other trees do you see in this picture? None. Imagine living your life isolated, alone, completely. We and trees crave interactions with others. Okay, so this tree, for as striking as this picture is, is actually not in a very happy place. Okay, there's something called the wood wide web that I doubt you've ever heard of, but if you have, that's awesome. And yes, I did say wood wide web, not world wide web. And the wood wide web is now a, a, a science, a scientific field, and understanding that 
trees are interconnected with with each other, even over longer distances of periods where their roots can't touch through fungal networks in the ground. And one tree can actually send nutrients to another tree that is in distress because it got that communicated to it via the fungal network and it can send nutrients from itself to the other tree to help it out. Phenomenal stuff, not stuff we're gonna be able to talk about today, but the wood wide web is something that is very important because people need connection too. We need to have that supportive nurturing environment around us of other people. Okay, so that's one thing that starts to us down the road on discussing nurture. So this tree actually stands a greater chance of developing a cancer, for example, than it would if it was sat amongst other trees. Okay, because we have that connection and because we actually support one another as do these trees. Okay, now, if you're isolated, if you're alone, if you're kind of sitting there without the supportive network, what might some of the results look like? Okay, now the other part of this is what happens if you're sitting in that toxic environment? What if you're literally living a life that is not very supportive in many different ways for you? Again, we can't not react. We always have to react. But what might these things look like? Well, what they look like in trees, in some trees, and you may see these when you're wandering around, I don't think in Central Park, but maybe you'll see some in Central Park as well, is you'll see these things that grow on trees that don't look like parts of trees. Well, they are parts of trees. So these are called burl, B-U-R-L, or in the UK, they're called burr, B-U-R-R. Now, these are reactionary growths in trees, usually from some type of trauma, be it a, a fungal infection, an insect infestation, something that it took up through its roots that was toxic to the cells within the tree, a tumor starts to form. And so this is really a tumor or a cancer on a tree. Okay, now if you were to walk by this, you might look at it and go, ooh, you know, something's wrong with that tree. It's gross. It kind of looks like a blob. Well, that is true on the outside, but what I hope you'll see in the next couple of slides is that there is so much beauty and so much wisdom to be learned from these particular growths. Now, if there's gentle attention, okay, to that particular burl, and remember, if you look at it on the tree, you go, it's actually diverting energy from the tree to grow and produce leaves. It's, it's starving the tree basically by trying to feed itself and grow its own tumor. That's very similar to tumors in certain human cancers. But if we look, we might start to think of ourselves as surgeons who might actually type, uh, help these trees out, if you will, by sizing or cutting off the burl, the cancer, okay? So with a little bit of attention, and a lot of, of looking at it so that we don't want to hurt anything when we're, when we're doing this stuff, we can start to see that we can take, if you can see that that's actually a long curved saw where I'm excising or cutting off a tumor from a tree. And it's kind of like removing a mold from your, your skin, if you will. You just kind of shave it off. And the tree is actually healthier because it now has no cancer. It has l less diversion of its energy, if you will, and it can dedicate more of its energy to actual growth that helps it out, okay? So when we cut these off, when I cut these off as a tree cancer surgeon, if you will, you start to see that with a little bit of work or maybe a lot of bit of work, it can turn into something else. Now, this is an example of me. This is actually my hands with my uh, whirling little chainsaw on a disc, if you will removing some of the uh, wood that is preventing really the beauty from being seen, okay? So as you can imagine, me as the carver, I actually get hurt while I'm carving these. You know, sometimes uh, I get cuts on my hands, sometimes the chain chainsaw touches parts of my body and I get really deep cuts. I try not to do that. But anyway, with a lot of hard work, really with, a, with some attention, this is what starts to be seen the most amazingly beautiful and value, value creations start to be seen. This is a picture of one that I carved from what's called a witch's broom gall on a silver birch tree. And what this is, is just, again, a massive tumor growth that will eventually break the branch that it's on and, uh, 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 and fall to the ground. And so this one's a bizarre set up. And these are the types of things that I want to share with you 
because this is a product of trauma. This exists because of, not despite, trauma and the ability of the tree to react. Our lives are like that. We can actually have this beautiful growth because of the traumas that we experience, not despite the traumas that we endure. Okay, this is one example of what materializes. But what you see is each of the things that I'm going to show you is absolutely utterly unique, just like you are utterly unique in this world. Your beauty is unlike any other person's. This is a very small uh, burl bowl that I carved. It's maybe about uh, three and a half or four inches around. But you can see that when we harvest these or when I harvest these, I keep the bark on some of them. Sometimes I strip the bark away. It just simply all depends on what's being called in the moment uh, from, from the art standpoint, if you will. But there's this beautiful interplay be between the shells of what keep us protected and these beautiful things that can be created when we remove uh, the, some of the unnecessary parts. Okay, So each one of us, each one of these burls are utterly unique. And the best part to me is that we are all absolutely connected. Every single one of us has the ability to have post-traumatic growth period. It doesn't matter what your version looks like. It doesn't matter what anyone else's version looks like. You have it. Every single tree has it as well. And every single one produces something that is unrealistically, unbelievably beautiful and unique, yet interconnected. So your trauma cannot not be understood by somebody else. They can't truly understand it. It's like pain. Pain transcends language, right? But yet, simultaneously, we can't not understand somebody's pain because we've all experienced it, it, experienced it, but yet we also cannot understand their pain exactly. So that's similar to what we see here is each one of these are utterly unique and, and everything is interconnected. Everything in the, in the growth of each of these was somehow similar enough to something else that we can start to look at them and learn from each other instead of really comparing ourselves in negative ways with, to one another. Now, like us, <laughs> we, everything really appears as a product of our various ways. You know, we all approach life differently. We all are exposed to different things differently. You know, and we all just simply exist differently. And that's okay. Because what happens is we start to see that each of our parts of our life, just like the different parts of a burrow, can really tell us a story. And sometimes the burl in, in this picture, kind of the upper right-hand section, was a different time frame, a different area, a different exposure than something that happened in a different part of the burl. That was a different time frame, different exposure, different concentrations of different things. And each of them react slightly differently. But in the in total, the most amazing landscapes can be created. Matter of fact, these landscapes can be seen in very intimate ways because if you start looking at the patterns within each of the growths of the burl, you can start to see a story. You can start to see that once it was growing this way and it started growing a different way, maybe there was a different exposure to rain that washed some of the chemicals, the toxins away. Maybe it was a different heat uh, uh, that it was exposed to during a summertime, whatever it is. Each one of these can start to be seen as a unique patterning that helps us understand the past. And one that I really like that shows this is this one looking from both inside the bowl, if you will, that I carved out and the outside. And so you start to see a story that can be understood from the inside, if you will, as well as a different story that can be told and understood from the outside. And so these burls sometimes grow um, uh, in an outward facing direction in very barbarous ways. So there's there's very sharp, pointy stick like even like porcupine quills that can be seen on some of these things. And it's it's part of a protective mechanism. Right. So we can see stories that uh, that are slightly different from the inside versus the outside. And then each moment of a burl, just like each moment of our own lives really gets etched into our very fabric. And this is just an up close uh, picture of one of the burls that I gathered up. And you can see like a topographical map, 
this is instead of being perfectly concentric growth rings that you can see on many trees, you know, when you cut them in half, these are actually lines that can be seen just underneath the bark. And so if I strip away the bark, sometimes I can see this. And these, each one of these lines is a period of time of growth for that tree. And you can see that some of these are growing in a, in a linear fashion. Some of these are circling around on each other. Anyway, they are unique and the story of this particular entity's life. Just like our wrinkles on our face, our laugh lines around our eyes, it doesn't really matter. Every single beautiful thing that we can see on our skin is a, is a testament to our life, okay? Now, these tell stories of triumph, for sure. They also tell stories of tragedy. But just because something is as tragic doesn't necessarily mean it can be seen as a bad thing. Life is just life, right? And the reason why Shakespeare wrote so much about triumph and tragedy is because they're so intimately intertwined, okay? Now, if we start to look at different types of stories, we can start to see that some of these have light periods. Some of these have dark periods, just like this particular burl. They simply show up looking at it from a whole. And what I like about Kripalu and the Whole Being Institute is we look at things holistically. And when we look at things holistically, we can start to see a bigger picture, a better understanding, if you will. Now, creating beauty in absolutely unimaginable ways to me, and I hope you agree. And so what I wanted to, what I wanted to do when I finish up here with the slides is just simply show of the, the different types of things, show you some of the different types of things that can be created. The first, are shelves. I've actually taken burl and created little shelves that hang off of walls and you can put knickknacks on them. And so again, this is just a section of a burl that um, quite honestly, in the wild, it would have rotted and decomposed and went back into the cycle, which is fine. But this one was shaved off and I, and I shaved it in different directions and created a series of little shelves that I hang knickknacks on. The next one that I thought was actually beautiful is I've created multiple sinks out of burls. Yes, you can actually use water in <laughs> and on wood, think ships. And so this is treated with an epoxy, but uh, I created a burl, uh, a burl sink. I've created multiple burl sinks. This one happened to come from an African tree that had a huge burl that was about four feet long. Uh, so it had a countertop as well as the sink and a cascade waterfall uh, faucet over top of it. The next one was a different one. It's a different thing that created. Uh, this this actually came from an oak burr. Uh, and, and again, just function can actually uh, happen as well as beauty. And so these are just a couple different sinks that I created. Another few ones are just decorative, uh, if you will, but they can actually serve as candy dishes if you like candy, or they can just simply hold knickknacks, flowers, potpourri, or whatever it is that you would like. The one on the upper right that you can barely see is actually an incense holder. So you can actually burn incense. It falls gently into the interior of the, the burl and you just whisk it by blowing away uh, the, the ashes. And so these are all uh, on, actually on my windowsill back in uh, the UK where I usually reside. And then in the end, I wanted to just simply show you that some of these can be seen as complementary. So you, what happens to one can actually be something that is similar to a different part of the tree or, or a different one. This just simply look like a yin and, yin and a yang to me, two different types of uh, burl. And then probably my most favorite is this particular one that served as the holder for my wife's and our wedding rings as we got married in Colorado a couple of years ago. Now, this one is a good example of an intertwining of two people as well as two different parts of the burl because the, the burl actually wraps around itself, if you will, forming the shapes of two hearts. Unfortunately, you can't see the other, the other heart uh, uh, from this picture, but it's, it's this yin-yang heart formation. And then there's a couple different important points that I would like to, to leave you with before Caroline and I uh, actually have a good conversation and possibly with you is that it's really only when we are when we allow ourselves really to let these outer shells of our lives be stripped away that we can start to see some beauty. And most of us, when we experience trauma, we do develop these shells. We develop like an armor, if you will, that is meant to protect us. But if you know anything about armor, 
it's extremely heavy and can really weigh us down. And so really it's only when we start to strip away these protective shells, like this is a in-between transition point of me debarking what I call a, a, an egg, a tree egg. So this is very similar to, again, a mole that would grow off the, your skin, you know, type of thing. We can actually harvest it directly off of the tree. The very bottom part of that is where it connected to the tree. But it's only when I take away that outer shell that you start to see these beautiful topographical lines that exist right below the surface. Most people walk right past these when they're walking in the park. I look at these as beautiful creations that I just go over, pop them off the tree, debark them, and then I give them as gifts to people who have um, experienced cancer. Okay, but we have to allow, if we are able to, allow our own outer shells, our own outer protective barriers, if you will, to be stripped away sometimes to see the beauty within. Next, we can start to see this beauty if we do start to dig deep or just at least to start to dig deeper into our current situation. And this is a this is an example of me using my hand carving tool to, to really, again, remove some of the, the bark that it is, is there. I'm sorry, not bark, but wood that is there. But in order to create functionality, like a bowl, we have to clear it out. Now, I don't use electronic equipment very much. I try to use as much hand tools as I can because that connects me with the piece of art that I am creating. And it's only through that very methodical, very concerted, very um, dedicated and quite honestly compassionate approach of removing small amounts at a time that I can finally start to see what the shape may eventually be. Where should I keep the wood? Where should I not keep the wood type of stuff? And then it takes a lot of sanding, a lot of abrasion, a lot of work to finally smooth it out into something that is a finished product. Now, the last part of this important point is when we really start looking at this stuff, we can see that there really is love within us. Always. It doesn't matter what burl I have handed to me, I can see love within it. And sometimes the love actually naturally shows up. I just follow the contours of the burl and lo, lo and behold, something shows up that really reminds me that life is about love. Life is about sharing that love. And so deeply within, we can find that love. And then we can also find it around us because it's not just within us, it is absolutely around us. And sometimes people will remind us just like somebody did in Aspen Alley they decided to, instead of carving their names, instead of carving a date, instead of carving something that didn't quite really mean anything, they decided to leave a note for me and maybe for you. We really are loved and we will always be loved. That's not in question. It's how do we share it? How do we show it? You know, how can we actually kind of approach life being given what we're given uh, and really just simply celebrate that we have opportunities to do this all the time if we just simply take them. And so that, my friends, is the end of my slideshow and I'm gonna stop sharing. And I would love Caroline to come back on and to join me because Caroline and Phoebe received something in the mail. And Caroline, what did you receive in the mail? <laughs> I received one of these beautiful burls and I wanted to show everybody sort of like this is a quarter so you can understand like from a size point of view how big it is and then this particular one has a, has a wonderful little you know uh, ear <laughs> little projection and um, I'm going to show you from the side so you can see that there is a, a surface and this is quite smooth and I shared this with some of you we had a NIA class this morning and then afterwards I was uh, we had some tea so Joanne and Mijanu and um, uh, several others were able to see it I want to show you that the side too in the back I'm going to see if you can see that there's the textures it reminds me um, Gary of flowers of roses of different shapes on the outside and this of course is is quite rough and then this Nijanu was saying that she felt like it was you know like when you have a worry stone you could circle your thumb around this and just feel soothed 
by it. And then I also happen to have Phoebe's with me so that people can look and see hers. And it's completely different and yet similar. In Neo, we talk about same but different, right? That, uh, like, well, like, let's say Gary and I are humans. So we are the same, but we are different. And this is what this reminds me of uh, a lot. And that I can have maybe the same experience, meaning I'm looking at the same vista, but my experience of it is different. So this idea of same but different is something that I find really curious. And then I'll show you the, this is bigger than the other one. Here's the quarter again. So you have a little scale to show it. And then in relationship, this is, you can see a little bit smaller, right? Wonderful. Um, so while, while you're talking about size, I will just simply show you one of the other ones if my screen doesn't cut oh out. Oh my gosh. This is, this is another one. So again, you can't quite probably see it. I don't have a quarter to put up there, but you can see my hand. My hand is quite big. Yeah. This it, is an, this is another one. Yeah. Now, now, just to let you know, I have some burl that are 350 pounds. They are literally something that I can barely wrap my arms around. And so the key thing to this is comparison of size does not equate to value or beauty. Okay. I have carved burl the size of my pinky fingernail. And you want to talk about difficult to carve, but I've carved it and I've taken up close up pictures of it with my macro on my camera. And you cannot tell the difference between that and this. Wow. Every single one of them are absolutely beautiful. And it doesn't really matter what the size is, what the shape is, um, it, they're all just there. And so Caroline, I wanna ask you. Mm -hmm. So when you, and I can't remember who you just mentioned about like a, like a worry stone Me or something you. that you can rub. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Have you, have you ever taken yours and just simply meditated with it? You know, close your eyes and felt the smooth surfaces, the rough surfaces. I have I haven't done that, but I'm actually in a process this week of using touch, a touch meditation. So I'm I will do that. I'm looking forward to that, um, because I find I do a lot of uh, meditation with touch, with fingertips, with touch of to, and I find that what happens to my nervous system is it calms down, and I come into the body. Yes. And the reason why I'm asking and that and I would like to, to share this with other people is that so my background is a chronic pain specialist. And so I started in pharmacy. Uh, so I know how to treat pain and chronic pain, especially uh, uh, pharmacologically. But I also am a pharmacist who likes pe to take people off medication where, where possible. OK, so so just to lay things out is pharmaceuticals only do what your body does normally naturally anyway it only enhances or blocks what you what is within your body in other words drugs do not create function within the body they simply do what you already you know to supplement what you can't in your own life at that particular point in time and so one of the things we know about chronic pain is any type of movement any type of therapy if you will that aggravates the pain you know that kicks in another pain signal if you will maintains the pain memory. And that's not that's not a memory that's kind of this touchy-feely, you know, type of thing. We're talking about neuroplasticity because that's my background, right? So every time we aggravate a painful pathway, it supports the maintenance of that pathway. But if we can take and layer on top of that pathway non-painful, very caring type of inputs, especially light touch, the more the memory of the actual pain will start to change. And so touch is critically important in pain management, okay? But never to the aggravating phase. And so if something hurts you to do, don't do it, period. Do everything else but. And so if you have a pain in your shoulder or whatever it is, touch your shoulder. And if touch hurts, don't necessarily touch it, just kind of just kind of move it. But if touch does not hurt, touch it as much as possible. Absolutely touch as much as possible because you're sending signals of that area into your brain saying, it's okay. 
it's safe. It's actually good. And so what we're doing with touch, and especially with these types of burl or worry storms or whatever it is, is we're meditating in positive ways. We're layering on emotional uh, information as well as tactile information, you know, as, as well as uh, your connection or whatever it is. And eventually we can take a painful memory, literal or metaphorical, or, you know, so if it's a mental thing or if it's a physical trauma, whatever it is, we can start to take that memory that exists and subtly start to transition it into something that is quite different. Wow. And touches touches one of those. And if we do it with our eyes closed, if we do it with other distractions that are kind of removed, it absolutely intensifies that input that comes. And so, so I really do recommend for people who are doing this stuff is to either remove every single distraction or put on some kind of music that absolutely is something that stirs your soul in a positive way and combine that with the touch because that's polypharmacy. That's what we want to, to do. So. I love that. In fact, Thank we can try it that. right now, you guys. We can actually, yes. if you if you will, um, find your fingers and see if you can, you might have to close your eyes to do this, see if you can feel the fingerprint. So you might have to slow down to do that of one finger upon the other. And as you're doing that, Right. What I find, Gary, when I do this is that my attention goes right to that place. And then go ahead, everyone, keeping your eyes closed and then bring your fingertips so that they touch one another. And once again, see if you can find, go slowly. And we'll talk about the importance of going slowly and moving speaking softly and just slowing down so that we can feel. And then take your hands together and rub them together slowly and feeling that tactile sensation and maybe one set of fingerprints rubbing down the hand and then the other. And even take the hands and just sort of massage the outside of the hands, rolling that around. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. <laughs> Yummy, right? And I find that what I use that, Gary, is to interrupt. So let's say I'm at work and um, I get a disturbing email or in which I, I need to respond and I need to react. Um, someone is in distress or someone's just gotten a diagnosis or someone um, is just irritated because they couldn't get on Zoom. <laughs> if I take, if I've, I've done a lot of that, if I take a break and do this touch, something happens. I am almost like filling myself up and I'm preventing that, that resource of of going into my brain with of, of sort of an alarm is that what's going on can you can you describe so i find that i respond differently when i'm Absolutely. when i'm in this place of kind of calm and peaceful and if i if i don't do that and i go for, oh i'm just going to fix it then it's a it's a completely different experience for me and for the person i'm working with yeah so when when we look at experiences that that trigger us into whatever state, you know, if it's if it's anger, if it's frustration, if it's whatever, right? Evolution. We have to think evolutionarily the way we're wired because when we were stressed twenty thousand years ago, thirty thousand years ago, forty thousand years ago, whatever it is, we either fought, fled, or froze. Okay. Now the freeze response is actually a very different response, but we'll talk about that too. But fighting and fleeing, right? This is the this is basically our sympathetic nervous system is absolutely discharging and we need to either save ourselves by, by fighting what was there or by fleeing what, what is uh, potentially hurting us, right? Well, in this modern day and age, we're being exposed to these same types of triggers that trigger our sympathetic nervous system to discharge. Cortisol gets released, epinephrine gets released, adrenaline gets released, right? Well, back in the day, we metabolized those, that cortisol, the epinephrine, all the, everything that was, that was released in a very efficient manner. We fought or we ran, okay? 
that's exercise. Exercise actually sends all the blood to the liver, to the kidneys. It helps metabolize all the stuff that was just released. And so in the olden days, we would have a stress response that would have this release of chemicals and that would, they would be metabolized very quickly. We reset our system. Well, in this modern day and age, we get stressed by a boss. We get stressed by traffic. We get stressed by whatever. And we sit for hours doing in the exact soup that our body released in the stress response, but it doesn't metabolize. And it's this prolonged phase that hurts us. Acute stress does not actually hurt us. It's the prolonged stress, okay? Now, if we cannot move by fighting or fleeing, and I don't re recommend you fight your boss, <laughs> and you're not really open to running away from everyone in a meeting, right? You can do the next best thing. And the next best thing is to really breathe. Breathe into the moment, breathe in a positive way because breathing actually increases your heart rate, the metabolism changes in your body. And so deep breathing is absolutely wonderful. So is touch. Touch is activating different systems within your body. You're not really running and working with your muscles, but at least you're layering on different input onto that stress response. You're now layering on, it's okay. Things are all right. So you're actually sending this bits of information into your system, which is actually better than nothing at all. So what you do, what you just said, is critically important because we shouldn't fight each other. And we don't necessarily have the luxury of running away. And the freeze response is the body basically shutting down. So the freeze response is probably the worst thing that can happen. When we are frozen and we can't do anything about it, be okay with it. Because what we can then do is start to avoid the situation that caused the freeze and all this other stuff, but eventually start moving yourself just gently, not in a shameful way, not with blame, not with anything else, but just moving yourself in gentle, gentle, gentle ways that will get out of, get you out of that freeze response. But Caroline, what you just described is absolutely from a physiological standpoint, very well described. And unfortunately, something that we're not taught, we're not taught to move. To handle stress, you know, we're taught to shut up, to, to get back to work, to whatever it is. And it's just like, no, we actually need to process this stuff. We definitely do need to process it at the first convenient time point we can. It seems to me we had some questions in the chat. One was that um, Deb was saying, it bothers me so much when I see perfectly healthy trees being chopped down. I imagine the tree is crying along with me. And Wendy said, I too cry when trees are chopped down. and um, I, I understand that too. I, there's something so majestic about them. They, and maybe it's because, as you were saying, it's the wood wide web. Is that what is it? Is that, is that yes. we're essentially yes. separating yes. a family, right? When yeah. we do that. Yeah, we are. And, and we, do, we do know that, that, that death is a natural part of life, right? And so when, when a tree or when anything else does go through a natural cycle of death, it's actually better than having it prompted by an external source for some reason, right? And so, yes, when trees do get chopped down, it, it, it definitely is an emotional response for us. What the tree is feeling is actually very interesting because we can't say that trees feel feelings like we do because they're not wired like we are. But we also can't say we understand that they're not feeling any feelings because they're not wired like this. It's like, of course they are. They, they interact with each other. So like I said, in this wood wide web is, when another tree is in, when a tree is in distress, it will send out signals through the air, through pheromones, basically, or stress responses. But it also connect through this wood wide web to another tree, and the other tree goes, "Oh, you need more sugars." Okay, so it changes its metabolism. It shuttles that through the wood wide web through the fungi, fungi, basically, feeding the other tree, and the other tree says, "Thank you." There's a beautiful book called "The, the Secret Life of Trees." Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone's read that, but that's another one of these books that you read, you go, oh, there's just so much that we don't know, but what we are learning is they are definitely connected, not just to us for, you know, for aesthetic reasons, they're connected to us by so many other reasons, they, they are certainly, certainly connected with each other. They're connected with the insects, so they're connected with all kinds of other uh, entities uh, that my wife is studying, so she's she's a zoology major, and she's she's getting into a lot of this stuff. And um, but it's a beautiful example of yeah, when we when we do, you know, remove nature from nature, 
there are definite impacts. And so I hear you. I I I I get I, I do more than cry when I see perfectly happy trees being cut down. I kind of get a little cranky, and I think that's okay. Uh, and I let people know about it. Yeah, an empathetic response to trees, Gary. I did want to ask you about sort of our beginnings. A lot of people have experienced trauma in childhood, and mm -hmm. you know, if you think about the human, like other animals. Our main goal, to, you know, up until we're what twenty, is to survive long enough so that we can pro procreate. So we have a judger in us. We have sort of shadow sides of us that are coping mechanisms that are a natural part of how we develop and and grow that protect us. But what I find interesting about that is that as we get older, unless we consciously sort of like you do with the burrow take them off and shave them in and say, wait a second, is this coping mechanism that I have developed as a childhood in response to me just wanting to be safe and still be alive, the most effective way to be alive? Exactly. Yeah. And it's something that, so, so none of us escape childhood non-traumatized. None of us, none of us, right? It's just a fact of life. Okay. Be it you know something that happens to us, around us, whatever it is, we we really do emerge from childhood with something. Something doesn't necessarily have to be catastrophic and, and impact our lives for good, but we all have these seeds, these these baby burrow, if you will, within us. Okay, and it's it's it really does benefit us to just simply sit with the present, you know, looking at it from the lens of the past to go, I'm okay. Most of us are actually okay. Are we ideal? No, an ideal is something that needs to be thrown out. Perfection is the assassin of progress. We know that, right? So if we stop going for perfection, we just simply go for better. Like Tal Ben-Shahar says, and I love Tal to death. He's, my, he's been my mentor for, for over a decade. Um, his book was happier, not happiness. It's a, it's a, it's a journey. Can I be happier, just a little bit happier today than I was yesterday? And if the answer is no, I'm not, I'm less go, okay, that's my baseline today, right? Now, for as far as childhood traumas go, it really does benefit us to just simply say, why were we traumatized in the past? It was probably because we had caregivers who were very well intended, who didn't have a book to read. They didn't have a guideline. They didn't have a manual. They were raised in, in probably traumatic environments. They were doing the best that they could, given the stuff that they had in the moment, right? And that should stop us from blaming people, you know, blaming each other for the stuff that happens. And so when I'm working with a chronic pain patient or a PTSD sufferer, I just simply go, okay, you're here. You're here. We can understand the past through this lens of compassion today, and we can start to change just something a little bit. And so just like the carving of a burl, it's, I don't want to take too much too quickly because I'll break the burl. I'll shatter the wood if I take too much. It's a very, very methodical, very compassionate type of just scraping out. And I'll even stop and I'll look at the shavings and just how beautiful they are. That's what we can do with our childhood traumas is we can take them and we can just simply start to peel them back. Not in any way that is re-traumatizing us because if we just simply peel back a little bit and go, it's still there and it's changed. Even subtly, it's starting to change. Eventually, with enough compassion, and it really is compassion to ourselves and compassion with others, we can start to get this stuff cleared out. And then we can step back and see that, wow, we have been given a gift, an utter gift, that trauma, those hardships provide us with learning that we can't get any other way. You know, and maybe that's why pain exists. I have no idea. You know, there's lots of theologians who have thought about this forever, but it's just like everything is an opportunity for us to grow, period. If grow we, ourselves and grow together. If we don't have that mindset, if something is yeah. in the way, is it our judger? And is it something that we then also have to do exactly some of those things where we reset the brain? Yeah, and so there's another question that I wanted to, to address. Yes, and so there's a couple you in there. Yeah, distress from trauma, and this is where we go. It is completely subjective, 100% subjective. And so all the labels we use, was it a stress? Was it a trauma? Was it okay? You know what? As we know in Buddhism is attachments are the root of all suffering, okay? The labels that we use to designate what we think we're talking about are attachments. And so for, to me, I don't really get hung up on somebody's labels. If somebody says that they have a trauma or had a trauma, I go, okay, 
And if somebody says, I, I had this happen to me and it wasn't traumatic, I go, okay, who cares about the label so much as what can you learn from it? So get past the label because one person's nickeling annoyance can be somebody else's major trauma, right? And if we stop with the labels, we stop with the judgments because in the end, every, all of these labels are subjective. And so it's, it's trying to just simply sit with what is, and pain, pain is a good example that I'll, that I'll end the comment on is, pain has been described as transcendent to vis verbal objectification, which means I cannot tell you using words exactly the pain that I am using or that I'm experiencing. You cannot tell me using words the pain that you are experiencing. And so pain transcends verbal objectification. Yet, I cannot not understand your pain because I've had pain myself on some different level. And so if we just simply sit with each other and go, I hear you, there's no way I can understand what you're going through. No way. I'm here for you. I don't need to understand it. Really, I just simply need to be with you. As you need to be with we, me, we have to be like these, these trees with some kind of wood wide web that connects us all. That's when we really start to share and, and really thrive with one another. Yeah. Deb had a question earlier when we were doing the gentle touch. And she said, interesting, because most therapists recommend active movement for chronic pain rather than pa passive touch. I don't know if you want to come off mute, Deb, and, and talk about that. But um, do you, I, I heard you say both are important. Yeah, and I love it because, because a lot of the therapists actually respond to how the patient is presenting. And so, so oftentimes it, there's an interplay between the patient and the therapist because the patients always want to have this image of being strong or, or being a lot worse off than they are. So again, we don't really judge ourselves objectively very well, but then the therapist doesn't judge us very well either. And so when, when therapists say, I want you to move this, but stop when it hurts, most people will move long after it hurts because they don't want to appear weak. They don't want to appear complaining. They don't. And th so it's a, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy both ways. Now, the important thing is all we can do is control us. And if somebody says, I want you to move this way, you say, let me test it out. I hear you. I hear that you think it's going to be beneficial for me. Fine. I'm going to see how much I can move. And so if they want you to do something where you know it's going to hurt you, you just simply say, I can do this without having it aggravated. Yes, I have to stretch myself because our, our, our growth zone starts, if you will, where our comfort zone starts to stop. There's an overlap. But our growth zone really does require us to be maximally uncomfortable. That's Mahali Csikszentmihalyi's flow is, is that maximal discomfort level. And I love this, that pain is inevitable. Deb, Deb, you're full of good stuff today. Pain is inevitable, right? Suffering is optional. That's not true because there are some people born with congenital insensitivity with pain. They literally do not feel pain. So pain is not inevitable for everyone, but these people die usually before they're 13 years old. So you might think the absence of pain would be a godsend. It's a curse. And it will kill you because you don't know how to react to your environment to stop the tissue damage from happening. Inflammation is tied to pain as well. So you can't uh, rally your immune system if you have congenital insensitivity to pain. So I love your, I love your saying, Deb. And it's so, so, so almost true. But suffering, suffering is always optional. Pain, pain is, pain is not in doubt, right? Suffering is one of these things that we can look at and go, if I am suffering, there's a part that I can actually control. Not all of it, not all of it at once. There's definitely some part I can scoop out, you know, just a tiny little bit and control it and go, I'm not suffering as much. Then I'm suffering less and less and less. I wanted to so address you, Fran's comment. Fran said, we have been fed life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness since we started school. But let's talk a little bit about happiness and also the pursuit of it. When we are in a state of ease, when we are in a state of balance where we're neither being triggered, you know, by that fear of flight, flight, freeze mechanisms, and we're able to have some distance and some choice as, um, you know, in between the stimulus and response, right? There's a pause, as Viktor Frankl says. Then isn't there an opportunity for health that doesn't Absolutely. exist? 
when Absolutely. we are just yeah. constantly hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. Yes, and, and I highly recommend to everyone because I'm an ultra marathoner as well. And so if you know anything about ultra marathoning, you have to take what are called active recovery breaks. Okay. And you are all ultra marathoners. You're in a thing called life. Life is a hell of a lot harder to, to navigate than 100 miles. Trust me, right? You know this stuff. So if we're going to get to the end, the finish line in fine form, we have to take active recovery breaks. They're not rest. I'm not being lazy. I'm not being you know, whatever it is. I'm not denying existence. I'm taking an active recovery. That is like taking your foot off the accelerator so your engine doesn't overheat. Okay. If you are not getting adequate sleep, water, the right food, and enough hugs in the day, your life is compromised. Start with those four. And yes, so this is this pursuit. So the pursuit of yeah, life, liberty, and happiness is like, okay, it's a nice saying, you know, that kind of has existed for a long time. Yes. Yes, we should pursue these things. And we should also just simply be happy where we are. I mean, we can be. I'm not a finished product. I'm not I'm not done yet. There's a lot of growth and and learning that I'm gonna have. So like um uh I think it was Gandhi said, or you know, somebody else probably said it as well. Love like you will live forever. Or sorry, learn as if you would live forever and love as if you would die tomorrow. That's one of my favorite sayings at all, uh, wow. of all. And that's what I like. And we've got the opportunities. We've got the opportunities. And thank you, Caroline, for, yes. for and JCC for providing these opportunities because I really do. Thank you. Yep. For you my pearls, way. I'm so excited and uh, to now expand my meditation to include this as I touch. And everyone, I really encourage you. My takeaways today, of course, are that it happens to us all. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And that what we can do, as Gary said, is to move. And move could simply mean by breathing, right? As we, if I think we need to breathe after we turn off the news, <laughs> right? Because that's very dramatic. There are little traumas that we experience through the day. And to take these things, whether it's touch, whether it's breathing, whether it's moving around gently, whether it's, you know, taking some active rest, they all make a difference in our post-traumatic growth journey. Thank you, Gary, for joining me. I could talk to you forever. And uh, thank you, everyone else. Yes, The Secret Life of Trees is, there was one last question that's about The Secret Life of Trees by Colin Trudge or the same title by Chiara Chevalier or the same title by Mara Butterfield or all of them. Do you remember, anybody know the, the correct uh, author? I know it's it has... Uh, it's a paperback and it has the trees on it. I'm so visual. Yes, yes. 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 Let's see if anyone in our, from our Zoom Unity uh, has knows that. Um, if not, look on Amazon.com and check that out. Sure. Thank you, Gary and Caroline, for such a creative approach to trauma and offering such a lovely ideas for supporter strategy when triggered. And Gary is not kidding because you as a pharmaceutical a pharmacologist, right? You mm -hmm. have experienced and worked with people in massive and intense pain. These Absolutely. small things are where you begin to heal. Yep. Thank you. Namaste, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Yeah, namaste.